Welcome to the HMO Property Podcast, where we connect, educate, and inspire the UK's HMO property community. So stop what you're doing, sit back, relax, and enjoy the story. What's up, HMO Nation, and welcome to another episode of the HMO Property Podcast with me, Rupert Wallace, in association with HMOHub.co.uk. In this episode, we're interviewing successful HMO property investor, Adam Cooper. Adam's going to take us on his HMO property investment journey, including the ups, the downs, the highs, and the lows. Now, Adam's been investing in HMOs for some 18 months now. He's completed 11 projects, currently housing over 140 tenants. So let's jump straight in. Adam, welcome to the show. Before we dive into the details, tell us a bit about yourself. Give us your background before you started your HMO journey. Okay, so when I was in school, all I wanted to do was cars, cars, cars. You name it, I was, I was doing private jobs at the age of 15 on people's driveways. I remember lowering friends' cars from pimping them up. I used to do day release at, at, at school to go to college to learn about cars as well. So when I was 16 to 19, I went and did an apprenticeship straight away. So I'm actually a fully qualified mechanic and MOT tester. But then I realized that wasn't the path there, and there's no money in it. And you, it just wasn't what I wanted to do. I, I like change. I, I liked being in new places, being out and about. So I looked into doing sales and got in, ended up in an estate agency. And then the rest is history from there, really. I learned the potential of property. Okay, so 16 to 19, you're doing your apprenticeship in a garage. And then how long did you spend in, a, in an estate agency? So I joined the estate actually about 20, so because I went a few, few different jobs in between. And then I stayed there for about two years. Came out of it for a bit. So I fed up, really fed up on selling houses to people like us who were making <laughs> the money. And all I was there was doing was wearing a cheap suit, a cheap watch, and driving a company car. So I thought, I didn't want it anymore. So I actually went back to being a mechanic for a little bit. I, mean, I actually trained to be a gym instructor at one point as well, because I used to be a competitive bodybuilder as well. And then, um, and then I went back into it. I figured, you know, pod this, I'm going to learn it all, start to finish. Joined a really small agency and grew them right from 80 properties managed to 245. Got them selling properties and exchanging on as well. I realized that HMOs was the path I wanted to follow. There's very few people specialising in this. Blimey. So my next question is pretty much redundant of what got you into the world of HMO property investing. I mean, I t- maybe maybe you could uh, answer us um, specifically why you saw HMOs as the golden ticket whilst you're in your estate agency days. I think what I saw when I was selling more houses to people when they were converting, obviously HMOs were quite a bit of a buzzword back then. This is when you're picking houses that really cheap in my area, you know, about 90, 100 grand. You're spending about 20, 30 on them and and you were killing it. Like people were cash burn a thousand pounds plus of these houses. And I saw that, but then I saw the good ones, or the okay ones, and I saw the really bad ones, which was the majority. And I realized like, great, this is a brilliant idea to make money, which I love, but when it didn't sit right with me, you know, sort of consciously, I didn't think that anyone should live in anywhere less than what I would live in. So I realized that we're working with a few select investors at the other agency who listened, we built, built really good places, getting better and better. But still about, you know, just a little bit off what we wanted to do, the boutique stuff we do now. So I realized that if I was going to make a difference and make money, which is you know, win-win, I had to open my own agency. I had to open my own investment companies and do it myself. All right, man. And was there anything holding you back from doing that? Oh, certainly. It was money. Money was the biggest thing for me, or perceived lack of money. You know, like everyone in property or new in property, everyone thinks the finances is the hardest bit to get. And it's really not, but I realised that was a lot of mind for it. And more than anything, it's your own limiting self-beliefs. But for a long time, that held me back. And um, what, what do you think um, made you make that decision to kind of get rid of those limiting self-beliefs? Like, what was the moment where you're like, I'm not going to let this hold me back anymore? I think when, when I got made redundant, so from my last agency I worked at, they actually, got, they actually closed down because of an HMO that the brother owned. 
Yeah, the brother owned, so it's weird. So the brother owned it and the agency did the paperwork, but the brother didn't do anything other than that, really, collecting the rent. They got, they got fined massively and closed down. And I realised it was now or never. You know, again, people weren't doing it right. And I realised that I just had to take it, you know, grab life and just go for it. So I did it. So I literally just remember sitting at home. It's like the 27th of December, sitting there on 2017, trying to work out company names and then thinking, oh, my God, I actually did it. And then from there, I've just kept pushing and pushing and surrounding myself with the right people as well. That's what it's all about. It really is. Adam, next up, tell us about your very first HMO property deal. <laughs> oh, that was a really interesting one, actually. That started off as my carpet fitter. Of all the people, my carpet company is Adam, I've got this great deal. And I went, oh, he's one of the, you know one of them guys, he's really lovely, but your version of a great deal and my version of a great deal and only two different things. So he come to me and I said, all right, what do you want to do? He said, let's flip it on. The guy only wants 115, it's worth 145. And I was like, okay, let's go take a look. I went and took a look and I, so I met the guy and I walked in the house and this is a free bed, mid-terrace council house, but it's really good nick. The guy said, well, out of interest, why, what sort of price do you want? He goes, 115. And I said, what brought you to that conclusion? He goes, well, we're next door, sold two years ago at 115, so I want, uh, 117, so I want 115. And I went, deal, done. Took his hand on it. And then I had an investor approach me that I'd been selling houses to for the agency and said, anything you can flip, we'll go 50-50, you bring the deal, we'll flip it. And I thought, that's a great deal, but what am I going to do with the money? I'm only going to then try and reinvest it to get a HMO. So what I did in the end was I convinced them to hold it. We converted it for about £6,000, personal loan out of ten grand to get it done in between refinancing, and we went a third, a third, a third. So we had this little house, we turned from a three bed to a five bed had an extra bathroom, all for about £6,000, so cheap, and just rent it out for like two years. Um, what did it cash flow? Pretty 1100 a month. Bad. Sounds like a pretty good first deal. Not bad, not bad, especially considering a finance thing that everyone said was a huge problem. Turns out it wasn't a huge problem. Again, like I said, it's all in my mind. There you go. Adam, how has investing in HMOs changed your life? Oh, it's changed it massively. So... As I say, I used to be a mechanic, I used to be bored, working in a workshop, dirty, filthy workshop all day, every day, for like £10.20 an hour, buying all my own tools, hating it, just doing a nine to five grind and being dissatisfied with life. Now, I, it's allowed me to take control. I run my own agency, we run a construction business as well, converting them for clients and for ourselves. You know, we source properties as well. We have the freedom, have the freedom and we actually have to help people. We have teams, we employ a lot of people now as well, pay a lot of subcontractors. So really, it just... Yeah, it's changed the whole dynamics of it. It's changed what I believe is possible in life. Mm. Um, it's funny, when we, ask, when we ask that question, we always get some interesting answers, but they're always ones of HMOs going hand in hand with personal growth. And it sounds like you've been on a real good personal growth journey, not just a property journey. It really is, honestly. I've, it's weird because I found that the fact that property helped me get more into business it's grown my business knowledge and then which has, in turn has made me have to grow as a person. So as I'm sure you know, when you grow in business, it takes a lot. It takes a lot more out of you than people realise. So yeah, that's why when I, we've got millions of books next to me, we're sat, the laptop sat on books to make sure it's high enough. You know, all because of, it's all the growth journey. It's so necessary to go with it. That's it, that's it. Perfect. All right, Adam, what is your favourite part of HMO property investing? My favourite part is, is the end product and seeing the tenants move in, to be honest. It really is. There's nothing better than seeing the end result, thinking back to 12, 14, 16 weeks before when it was just a shell of a house. Seeing how happy the tenant genuinely is when they see it's as good as it was in the pictures. Oh, it's not just good photography. It's very good photography, but it's exactly as it looks. So not finding the deal, but fully, you know, getting it, getting it to this boutique co-living style um, wonderful place for people to live. Uh, I guess that just goes back to your previous comment about, you know, giving someone the opportunity to live in a place that you would love to live in yourself. So true, honestly. I love seeing, I just love them being actually happy with it and realising there's some good guys out there in property. Not all agents are bad, not all landlords are bad. Holding it down for our own. I like it. Adam, we've talked about the past. Before we move on to the present, and your future plans in HMO property. Let's take a minute to thank our sponsors. 
Are you looking for an effortless HMO mortgage experience? If that's a yes, there's only one place to go, www.thehmomortgagebroker.co.uk, the UK's number one specialist HMO mortgage broker. They're so specialized that they don't do anything else. HMO mortgages, HMO remortgages, and HMO bridging. That's it. They have access to every HMO lender out there, and even some exclusive products not available to other brokers. With lightning fast service and A1 communication, they're easily the best HMO broker in town. So to experience HMO lending made easy, go to www.thehmomortgagebroker.co.uk today. Adam, fast forwarding to the present day, tell us a bit more in detail about your current portfolio and HMO businesses. Quite interesting because I'm a big believer of holding assets you know, for life. But this year, last year, I actually sold two assets. <laughs> so I had one H. So we had four HMOs last year. Split one of them on with a partner. We did a four bedroom conversion from a two bedroom detached. Made 60 grand profit on that between us. So couldn't couldn't say no to that. Got I got another one, a five bedroom. My first real big one. And then my first big JV. We spent be my name doing this. It was a we hold it forever. But then the same buyer that bought the other four bed tick conversion come at a price which so good, you just couldn't say no. That's just about to exchange and complete probably next week. And I've got another seven bed tick conversion just sat there waiting to go probably next month. It's just finalizing planning and then built. And I've got a four block of block of four flats we're gonna do an assisted sale on at the minute, it's just going for illegals, change into eight studio flats. Uh, all they're guaranteed by again the same buyer as all the other two again at a crazy price you know, good wow. value. Yeah, it's a big corporate buyer it's actually a council buyer from not the local but from a different different region trying to make their own money we have heard of this a few times now on hmo hubs for uh, you know the um the housing associations not being able to find enough stock locally and having to uh having to figure things out in you know one or two counties along so be very keen to hear hear a little bit more about that. I mean, how did you how did you come across those guys out of interest? It's just a really good relationship with local agents, to be honest with you. You know, I, I know. I think we always stress about relationships and property, and I think we always stress about agents as well. But I think people look at the volume too much. For me, I've got one or two really really good agents in Peterborough where I work. You know, who I will you know if they bring me a deal. Like I got a text this morning of a deal. Probably going to buy it because they know exactly what I'm looking for. So they realized that I built good product, good quality products. Their buyer was happy with the product. So they got the commission really easy. It was like a one view and one deal done. And for a really good commission because the HMO is worth so much. So now we just deal with him. You know, just literally the one contact in, in that same agency. We go to him, I put my plans to forward, I go, this is what I'm going to do. And he reverse engineers it and goes, they will buy, they will buy it for this price. Based on the yield. Based on the yield, exactly. So then I can be exact, and I can be like, "Yeah, this is a deal, or it's not." Finding the buyers, that's where it's at. Uh, Adam, next question. Talk to us about your single best HMO investment to date, and it doesn't have to be for the money. I think, it's but probably, it can be. <laughs> it's going to be about the money. It's got to be. It's this yeah. assisted sale deal. So I can't, I won't go too, too in depth, but that, that's what I said. It's four flats at the minute, really run down Victorian property. We're turning it from four flats, self-contained flats to a big H studio, eight bed to HMO, potentially 10, literally plans are in drawing as we speak. Now there's, so we've agreed that sale already as the eight studios for the same buyer. So they know the product, if they've bought two of mine so far They know what they're getting, they know the yields and I even rent to rent them back off of them afterwards for a fixed price. So I make more money then. So the house, selling the house, would be a hundred grand profit, and then in the deal, an assisted sale deal. An assisted sale. So you don't deal. even own it. Don't even own it. But get this: this is the cream. There's some land at the back. It's had planning laps on twice for four one bed flats. That's getting gifted to us as part of the assisted sale as well. So then we're going for planning on that land as well. Probably build and fit that on. Wow! Sounds like there's another hundred grand there at least. Easily, we're looking. There's there's me and two partners in it. We're looking between. We just get planning on the land and flip it on between sort of 20k and 60k each profit. Fantastic. No wonder that's your best one. That sounds superb. Also, I really like the deals where 
a lot of it's the paperwork exercise to extract all the value. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot of power in that. But interesting that you found a really good buyer that you can flip a project on based on yield and then rent to rent it back from them. It's how many strategies in one go? No, and the best thing is they actually want you to rent to rent it back from them as well. So it just goes to show we are solving landlords' problems when you do rent to rent as well, guys. No? Well. Tell us, Adam, changing the tone a little bit, tell us about one significant mistake you've made in your HMO business on your journey that you think by sharing you might help others avoid. Biggest mistake, I and mean, it's a big one to share, structuring JV deals. Again, like, like yeah. most people, that's got an investigator, Adam, I've got X amount of money, and it was six figures plus, you know. I went, oh my God, you know, but as you do. So of course I bent over backwards to make it happen. But the process structure is such a deal that I wouldn't see any funds out of it until basically the loan had been returned back to the investor, then it'd be 50 50 cash flow. And the, the deal slowed down. So I thought we were going to get four or five in the space of two years. And I thought, oh, it will, it will balance out after two years. And there will X amount coming in, like it will be worth it. But I didn't, didn't account for different investing styles. Me and the investor are very different people. So whereas I'm like, let's go and get it done, let's get it done. Very left brain of the investor. He's very analytical, lovely, lovely guy. But doesn't want to move as quick as I do. So then we didn't end up getting enough. So I didn't see any cash out of the deal. And so obviously that's really demotivating. And so you've got an investor which you've made a commitment to. Got on of that. You've got a, a house. You put all the work into it. No cash flow. So if you were going to do that differently, what would you do? 50-50 from the start. Everyone's got to be incentivized. Okay. I Knowing your value, isn't it? Knowing your value, knowing what you bring to the table. Absolutely. And there are, you know, an infinite number of different ways to cut a JV, um, depend, especially depending on the deal. The more complex the deal, normally the more complex the JV. Um, but we often find the people that answer this question, the people that succeed on the JV is the ones that just keep it really simple. True. Really is. All my other deals now when it's JV, it's just... No funny business. One side brings the money. I bring the deal and the build. We all know what we're doing. Easy. Next up, tell us about your HMO portfolio plans for the next 12 months, Adam. What are you up to? Uh, so I've got the seven bed sit conversion in planning process at the minute. Battling on planning at the minute. One of the big things around my area is parking. Anything over six and we suddenly need one and a half parking space per occupant. So this is my, my little guinea pig to see how we get on with it. But then I've got the assisted sale deal, which is just a pump in. I want to hold buy and I hold another five. I've got a business partner who's just come back board and definitely raised a load of money. Now it's time to knuckle down, find the deals, and, and just explore a few new areas as well. Parking, not so much of an issue. Good stuff. Sounds like it's going to be a busy, busy 12 months. It's going to be huge. I mean, we've got six, six, well, five client builds and one of my own already. We want to add another six, plus there's already another client, we've got about three clients in the pipeline, sort of debating whether to get a house and get the builds done as well. It's going to be crazy. Got it. And apart from building the portfolio, is there anything else that you're up to in property that you'd like to share with HMO Nation? Yeah, like I say, we run a company called Freedom Homes in Peterborough. We're a specialist management agency in HMOs. So again, like, like I said, Rupert, I believe if you're going to do this business, it's got to be done right. It, it's challenging. It really is. You know, I always say that if I wasn't, if I didn't run a management agency, I would always get someone else to manage my portfolio. Because it's the lifestyle you're trying to choose. But yeah, I mean, we build them. So that's a massive thing, being hands off for all our landlords. Um, Adam, what advice um, would you give to current HMO investors? Get creative. If you're looking at deals, don't just look at them just as, you know, generic. But we do a lot of bed sits. I find a lot of people, when they, when they see us doing bed sits, they see us, all we want to do is all bed sits, and they can't get all bed sits, we're out. It's, it's really not the case. Bed sits came about for me as more of a strategy to fill up empty space and also make deals stack up better. Deals where uh, it's getting a bit tough in the market, look at these things creatively, guys, and just you know, find out how you can squeeze more money out of the deal, more money in cash, flow, more money in value on the commercial finance. And stuff. Like, looking at commercial finance as well, it's not everyone's cup of tea, but if you want to keep moving in, in an ever-growing market, 
Got it. So in terms of advice for those HMO investors, you're just saying get creative, um, try and look at a deal from more than, you know, as many angles as humanly possible. Exactly. I mean, that's a, a sale deal, Rupert, for example. That I looked at to buy it myself. I looked at it and we just couldn't make it work. You know, it wasn't worth what it was worth to me. But between me and the agent, we got chatting about potential, potential buyers, what the seller was willing to do. Because we've got a good relationship back and forth with the agent, was able to make an assisted sale deal, so I make money out of essentially what was a losing deal. Got it. A lot of money as well. Next up, <laughs> it's a good win. How about any advice you give to people who are looking to get into HMO property for the very first time? An interesting one, because I, I mean, I'd always say about get, getting some training, but obviously be, be careful who you get trained with. You know, don't just go spending money willy nilly. You don't need to learn absolutely everything in one go. Not going to be use of you all in one go. You need it as as you need it. You need the basics, the fundamentals, and then keep adding to it. So get friendly with people on all these forums. There's so many people out there, and people like myself, people like you, who who will help people. You know, I've learned tons and tons and tons of social media. There's a lot. There's a lot of information out there for sure. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. You just got to be careful who you go to. Um, but yeah, get on online networking is totally the way. Really? Got it. And how about if HMO Nation want to connect with you? How can they do that? If you want to connect with me, guys, you can look me up on freedomhomeslimited.com. Uh, you can get on our Facebook page, Freedom Homes. You see all our boutique rooms. Hit me up on Facebook as well, profile, or I'll drop my email probably on the when it goes live. Yeah, we'll make sure we list it on the show notes page for you, Adam. Adam, we salute you. Thank you for sharing your journey. Let's get an HMO high five. And um, we look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks, Adam. Awesome stuff, Rupert. Cheers, man. Thanks for joining us. If you've enjoyed this and want more informational, educational, and inspirational HMO property content, then please hit the subscribe button and give us a like. See you next time.